Uh, thanks everybody for coming out to Hacktivity this year, and it's a, it's an honor and a pleasure to to be invited out. I'm really excited to be here. And I know it's a little bit early, but I wanted to start out with a little bit of a game, or maybe a, an experiment in psychology. Uh, if you've heard of this game, word association, it's pretty simple. If you're not familiar with it, the idea is that you hear a word, and then whatever comes to your mind first, you, you say. So if I were to say cat, maybe you would say dog. Or if I were to say water, maybe you would say rain. And there's no right or wrong answer. And the psychology part of it is really, the idea is that your response probably has something to do with your experience with your, or the history of that word. Um, so carrying that forward and thinking about why we're here, what do you think of when you, when you see those words? Software security. Any, any volunteers? Fail. Fail? <laughs> so I, I've, I've come up with some typical reactions to this word. And um, I'm also going to use it as a chance to practice my Hungarian. So you can let me know how my, my accent is or my pronunciation. Somoru. Uh, Sad, is that software security be, can be kind of depressing. Uh, kinosh, embarrassing, maybe, it's kind of shameful. Uh, trifa, a joke, humorous. Um, and I think if you've been in security for a while, these are all reasonable. And again, there's nothing, there's no right or wrong answer, but you know, we're all getting together here to sort of learn from each other and try to think about how we can make things better. So. I'm going to pick a word that's uh, much, more, much more positive and much more, uh, hopefully, optimistic. Unfortunately for me, it's also uh, much harder for me to pronounce this word. Uh, I'm going to try it. Opportunity. And I think we're at a point now where we have this really interesting convergence of how we develop software, how we operate software, and some of the underlying technology that actually presents a really interesting opportunity for security people. And that, that opportunity is really about visibility, and that's where the name for this talk comes from, building a glass house. You see, this is the Philip Johnson glass house. It's in uh, Connecticut in the United States. As you can see, all the walls are glass, so you can see in and you can see out. And as security people, visibility is very important to what we do, right? We want to know what are our most critical assets? And where are the vulnerabilities? How is our environment changing? And how do those changes impact security? So what I want to do is talk about, you know, this will be the theme. And what I'll try to do is weave in some examples of, of what we've done at Netflix to try to seize this opportunity and try to improve visibility. So just a little bit of background. I'm at Netflix. Um, I've been there about three and a half years. I lead the security team there. Uh, that includes product security and fraud and corporate information security and all that fun stuff. Uh, prior to that, I was at VMware. I led the security team there, a virtualization software company, and then spent most of my earlier career as a security consultant at a few different places. And uh, Netflix is a streaming video provider. Uh, what we do is we take the movies and the TV shows, and instead of making you have to uh, know what time they're going to come on TV or go to the movie theater, we'll send them to you right over the internet. You can watch all you want. Uh, no commercials. Watch on any device you'd like. So we're not in Hungary yet, but uh, we are supported in about 50 different countries. We have about 50 million members. So we'll talk about some of, uh, some of the stuff we've, we've done at Netflix. But first, I want to start with software historically. How have we built it? How have we operated it? And what can we learn from it? Um, first is waterfall, right? The idea of the waterfall development pattern is pretty well established. And the idea is that there's a, a linear approach to developing software, where you might start with requirements, and then you do a design, and then you write code, and then you test and release, and then you kind of start over. Another big part of software historically has been um, this idea of monolithic software, where you keep adding more and more features, and the software just gets bigger and bigger. Uh, the best example I have of, of monolithic software is uh, at a, a company I used to work at. We just had one main customer system where we did all the orders and everything. 
And it got so big and complicated that when we would need to do a release, uh, it actually required about 18 hours of downtime to do all the configuration and all the code pushes and lots of coordination of about 100 different people. Um, so that's monolithic software in a nutshell for you. Uh, software is also tend to be long lived. Um, and this really starts from the hardware. Uh, we, we tend to buy a piece of like a server and that, that server has a life cycle of maybe three years or maybe five years. And we install an operating system onto that hardware. We install an application onto that operating system. We patch the OS, we upgrade the app, and we do our best to try to keep that healthy and, and running for the lifetime. Uh, and then from an operational or organizational perspective, we've tended to split on the bounds of having one group develop the software and a separate group operate the software. And that can lead to conflicts because a lot of times uh, their, their goals are not really well aligned. But carrying that forward, if that's sort of the history of how we built software, how has software security evolved and, and grown to, to match that? And there are some, some common characteristics. One of them is the idea of gates. And this fits with that waterfall model where a gate is some process that you have to go through before you can go to the next phase. Maybe you have to do a threat model before you can start writing code, or maybe you have to do a penetration test before you go to production. There's also touch points. And touch points are typically the security team is small, the engineering team is, is larger. You can't be involved with everything. So a touch point is really these sort of forced interactions that we have with between security teams and engineering teams to try to influence software security. Uh, and then last is testing windows. And these are the periods of time when um, I can do some testing. I can maybe run static analysis or I can do a penetration test or uh, do a, some kind of vulnerability scan. And if I were to collect everything, uh, at least in my career in security about the last 15 years or so, everything that we've learned uh, in terms of how we build secure software, how we operate it can be sort of uh, combined into Microsoft's security development lifecycle or SDL. Uh, certainly Microsoft has a, um, doesn't have a perfect track record with security, but uh, they really have put a tremendous amount of resource into thinking about this problem and, and providing that information to us as a public. Um, there's also many other sources of, of good data out there about how to build and, and operate software securely. So we're kind of at this point where we have all this knowledge about how to do it, right? I'm not saying that we, we, that we can actually do it, but we, we, we theoretically know how to build secure software. So we can just sort of get on this train and, and sort of take it to our destination. Um, but of course, that's not really the case. You know, things change as, as, it, as happens in technology. And, and there've been a lot of changes, but what I wanna do, I, what I, I think this book here sums them up pretty well, at least as they're relevant to this topic. Um, this is a book that came out probably two or three years ago. Um, if you haven't read it, I, I recommend picking it up. It's written as a novel, but it's about IT, it's about software development, it's about security. And the main point f for this purpose is that if you think about how your, say your organization, how does your organization use technology versus how it, how it did five years ago or 10 years ago, um, if the chances are that the use of technology has probably grown quite a lot. We are very dependent on technology. And what the Phoenix Project is saying is we haven't evolved our processes and our way of interacting with it and developing software and operating software to match how important technology is. Uh, so that's what I want to kind of go through because Netflix, we actually had a, a sort of Phoenix Project moment of our own where we realized that the way we were doing things wasn't going to work for us. Um, and uh, you, may, you may not know, but Netflix actually started as a DVD by mail company. And you would go to the website, you would choose the DVD you wanted, we would mail it to you, you would watch it, send it back, kind of keep repeating that. But we had this, in 2008, we had this massive outage, uh, where it was basically an Oracle database got corrupted. And uh, it shut us down for about four days. And while we started as a DVD comp company, we always knew we wanted to go into streaming. And 
this was right about the time when we were really starting to mobilize towards that. And we realized we couldn't, you know, this wasn't going to be acceptable when you're a streaming uh, service. If you think about the technology differences between running a DVD website and a streaming video website, if I'm, if I'm a DVD customer, I only need to go to the website maybe 30 minutes a month, right? And I go, I pick my 10 movies out, they start getting mailed to me. I never need to go back to that site. Of course, there's logistics happening on the back end to get those mailed, but I, I never interact with the site. Versus a, a streaming video site, what, what needs to happen when I go and, and look at the TV show or movie I wanna watch and I click play? It's pretty complex. I, we have to figure out you know, what CDN are we going to steer a customer to? Uh, we have to issue DRM licenses to authorize that session. Uh, we need to start getting telemetry from the client device to figure out, you know, how is the quality of service? Do I need to change the bit rate? I need to start tracking bookmarks so that if you click pause, I know where to put you back if you, once you pick it back up again. So those are all really complicated real-time systems that need to be working all the time. So I think in the long run, this, this big outage was probably a positive for us because it realized the route we were going on with this monolithic software this separate organization, this waterfall model was not really appropriate. So I kind of use that to move into what software, how, how is software built today? And this is, not, this is not how everybody builds software, but I would look at this as more of sort of the leading edge of how, say, startups or, or larger uh, internet companies are building software. Uh, and the first characteristic is, is agile, and I won't try to define agile per se, but this, to me, encompasses this whole range of iterative software development where we're gathering a lot of feedback, we have quick cycles. Uh, I also lump in things like continuous integration and continuous deployment here. Uh, another feature is microservices. So this is sort of the anti-monolith. So when we had a monolith at, at Netflix, uh, it's a Java code base, so all the individual teams, they would tend to own some jars, some libraries, we would push code twice a week to, or excuse me, once every two weeks to production. So everybody would check it in and kind of work like that. Uh, when we moved uh, sort of uh, to a, a distributed model and we built a microservices architecture, anybody who owns some component of that, now you own a network service and you communicate with your other services over REST APIs. It's no longer this monolith. So there's about 600 microservices that comprise the Netflix service. So all those different, be the different components, whether it's DRM or logging or all kinds of playback services. Uh, so that's, it's, and each one of those teams can build and deploy as quickly and as often as they want. They don't have to wait for that two week cycle. Um, another strong component of, of this new approach is immutable infrastructure. And this also has a bit of a, um, kind of a, a complex definition, but really for our purposes, it's instead of that long-lived software where we're gonna upgrade and patch, that's kind of that idea of nursing software. Immutable infrastructure is more around like killing software. So when I have new software to, to push, I'm going to actually build my whole stack from scratch and deploy that. And now this is really only possible when you're talking about virtualized environments or cloud environments, but this really changes the way that uh, we think about operating software. Um, and then last, organizationally, is this move towards DevOps and NoOps. Um, and again, this is another one that has a lot of different definitions. Um, the key to it, I, I like to think about the Amazon model of DevOps, where if you build it, you run it. There is, for, like, for Netflix, there is no operations team. We don't have an operations team. Uh, individual teams build their software, they deploy their software, they manage the software. If, if an alert goes off at 2 a.m., if it goes down, they're the ones who get called. There is no separate team that. Um, so when you have that model, uh, it drives vastly different behaviors uh, operationally. So what about security with all that? So we've had all these changes. Can we just take all that we've known about security and just, and just sort of adapt it? Well, I think that's best summed up with this um, this slide I saw a couple weeks ago after the AppSec USA conference. And it's basically, a, a, that's a gravestone up there if you can't see it. Um, and written on it is traditional application security. We hardly knew you. Um, and I, I sort of take that to mean, you know, we, we spent the last 15 or 20 years figuring out how do we secure all these processes. And now you've gone and changed everything on us. So 
what do we do now? And to me, there's really two, two primary reasons why that old way of doing application security and software security no longer works. And the first is speed. So when you think about Agile, when you think about DevOps, that's really all about getting features out faster. So at Netflix, we, we used to deploy code, uh, just a single code base, once every two weeks. We're now at the point where I mentioned we have these 600 microservices. Individual teams, some of those teams actually deploy 200 times a day uh, into production. And there's over 5,000 production pushes a day. So when the environment's changing that fast, things like testing windows and, and you know, this, it doesn't really match up. So we need to think differently. And then the next uh, big factor is scale. And this is a picture of one of Amazon's warehouses. And I think the impact of scale on security is similar to the impact of scale on hardware. Where if you have, say you have a piece of hardware that's really reliable, say a hard drive, it only fails once every 20 years. I, I don't know if that's good or not, I'm just somewhat making that up. But even if you had that and it's very reliable, if you have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hard drive, the something is always failing. And when you have a really big environment that's always changing, there's always something wrong, right? There's always some security problem and you don't know about it and how do you find out about it? And it's usually not as easy to see as this yellow egg where I, I know where my problem is. And that, that really gets to the idea of, of visibility. And how do we go uh, from this left-hand side where, you know, this is the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And it's, it's many times it's covered in fog, but there's also times when sometimes the fog lifts and we can see everything. So then how, how do we, you know, think about, you know, with everything changing so fast, with these massive environments, how do we find the security problems that we should be most worried about and we should be thinking about? So what I, what I want to do is talk about some examples there and kind of start at a high level and sort of dive in. Um, the first idea about visibility is just knowing your environment. And this seems very sort of trivial or maybe elementary, but if you've been in larger environments, you know that just knowing what's there is actually quite a lot of work. Um, if you think about it, if you just had, say, a single rack in a data center, you could, you could sort of know what you had there. But then once you throw on, say, virtualization, now maybe instead of one server, now there's 20 virtual servers there. And then you add, you know, you have people starting to use AWS or, or uh, Azure or these cloud services. You use third-party services. All of a sudden, as a security person, you're kind of like, well, I don't, I, I don't know. And then things are changing so fast. So any assumptions you had about what you're really responsible for, or your inventory, kind of go out the door. So our, so when, when I first got started, I knew because things changed so fast and it was such a massive environment, I knew we were going to have to spend time really thinking about this. And our, our answer to this was uh, we built a system called Monterey. Uh, Monterey is a, um, it's a, it's a nice area of California south of San Francisco. And uh, it has a lot of sea otters. And we've adopted the sea otter as sort of the mascot for our security team. And uh, if you're interested in the, some of the details of Monterey, my colleague Kevin, uh, who's the primary developer, he did a talk on this at AppSec USA a few weeks ago. And that's on YouTube if you want to um, check it out. But Monterey was really designed to take inputs from all kinds of different sources to build an inventory. Um, so we have IP ranges from data centers and, and just you know, different systems that we own. We have, uh, many, we have thousands and thousands of different Amazon instances, so we want to pull that information in. We have lots of third parties and DNS and things like that. So it, Monterey is designed for four things. The first one is just discovery. So just provide a generic way of, of intaking all that data and then really build an inventory off of that. And what we realized is, is the work that we did to, to, to intake this data and keep it updated as things changed actually pro provided the basis for uh, a reliable execution engine for security tests. So that's the next thing we use it for. Now, um, if you're familiar with tools like um, Mozilla's uh, Minion or Gauntlet, uh, we looked at some of those things, but what we wanted to do was build something that would, would scale a little bit more. So that's really what we do. Um, so we have this inventory, and then we can launch things like Arachni scans or Zap scans, lots of our own custom security tests, and then, of course, uh, reporting out of it. So this is something that we ended up putting a lot of resource into, but it's, it's, it's paid off quite well because it gives us a good sense 
of what our environment is and how it changes and how we should um, change our security tactics based on that. So not everybody needs to build something like that. Um, I think lessons learned from that process, sort of takeaways. I would say tailor your discovery to how fast things change, right? If you only have a, a small network, maybe you can just say run an Nmap on that once a week and, and see how things might change, or you have some other inventory system. Uh, but then also think about normalizing that data uh, as inputs to your security testing. So the next thing, uh, kind of going a level deeper in terms of visibility is, is risk prioritization. So assume first that you know all of your applications, right? That's it's a big assumption, but assume you know everything. Uh, I'm also going to assume that you don't have enough security resources to look at all that, right? You can't pen test every app. You can't look at every line of code. So how do you decide what you're going to work on? Um, how we've done that historically has tended to be manual, where maybe it's a, an Excel spreadsheet and you have a bunch of questions you want somebody to fill in, and then you calculate some score to tell you, well, this is a, a high-risk high application. But that, that kind of approach has a lot of problems. First, it's manual, right? You're assuming that the person understands the questions and can interpret it properly. You're assuming that you, that you can get a spreadsheet in front of every developer who's building an app, and it's also pretty static, right? Maybe today this app doesn't handle credit cards, but maybe six months down the line it does. So we wanted to, to solve that problem since we have these, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different apps that change all the time. Our, our, our goal was to build a system that would help us with that problem of automatically evaluating it without any... Uh, you, without any input from the developer. So that was the goal. And to do that, we built a system called, uh, and we, we called it Penguin Shortbread, which is kind of a strange name, but the reason that, na that name came about was um, we started building this around the time of the NSA leaks and like the Snowden stuff and all those crazy government programs with those really cool names like Egotistical Giraffe came out. So we wanted to have a name like that. So we came up with Penguin Shortbread. And what it does is a benefit of having things like cloud and immutable infrastructure and microservices is that you tend to have infrastructure that supports things like service registry and service discovery that you can plug into to learn more about how things talk to each other. And Netflix open sourced uh, a, a piece of software called Eureka a few years ago that does this, that helps us gain information. So. Our goal with this tool was to passively observe a system and then try to make, an, uh, try to make a uh, statement about how sensitive that system is. So basically what we do is we calculate a number of metrics that go into this score. Uh, this is an example metric. So this is dependent applications. You can imagine in a distributed system, if, if, if I have an application and say 200 systems depend on my application, I can use that as a proxy to how important that system is. And that's what we do with this metric. So you can see the scoring scale there. The more systems that depend on this system, you're going to increase the risk score. And what we do is we have a number of these different individual metrics that we gather to score an app. Um, things like, is it an edge service? Meaning, does it directly receive internet traffic? If so, that should raise the score. And then what we have is instead of this list of 600 or 700 apps that we don't really know, uh, you know, which one is the most important, we have kind of an ordered list based on this scale that we've developed. And it continually observes. So as things change, as new apps come in, we can, uh, we can tell how things have changed. And sort of takeaways from that, one of the, one of the um, suggestions I would have is to think about, well, what could you passively measure? Right, objectively measure about your system. Uh, I've done previous work in this area where you look at, you, you would say you would observe a website. Uh, does the website use SSL? Does it have a login page? Does it have dynamic inputs? Those kinds of things, and then you use that to sort of build up your, your knowledge of how sensitive or how risky that app might be. And then you also want to use it as an input, right? It's not the law, so we don't just take that and just use that as, um, you know, we, we don't work directly off that, but we want to use that as an input to how we think about risk in the system. And then, and then sort of going a level deeper, 
I want to talk about this idea of multi-layer security testing. And what we try to do with, with our environment is, is really deconstruct the approach to security testing. And so this here is a, this is a deconstructed uh, Formula One race car. And so you could imagine it, you could do tests on the car when it's put together. You could also test each individual component. And there's probably certain components here that are, that are more important to test. And I, th I like to think about that like a, like a pyramid, right? What's on the bottom that's supporting everything else? And can you leverage your, can you focus your testing effort there? And so we wanted to do that. We took that approach. And it turns, and it turns out when you, when you think about immutable infrastructure, um, that's actually quite easy. So at the heart of immutable infrastructure is the idea of a base image. So this is like a gold image or a, a base virtual machine template. It's the system from which every other system is built. So we, we have ours, and we call it the base AMI. Uh, AMI is an Amazon um, acronym for Amazon Machine Image. That's just their, their virtual machine template. So every single system of many, many thousands of systems we run all originates from this one base. So we want to focus our testing there. But the nice thing is when you think about continuous integration, the base AMI is managed just like any other software package, right? It's in a Git repo. It has a Jenkins job to build it. And what we do is we just watch that job. That job, when that job kicks off, that means something in the base AMI has changed. If you think about the old days, the old way of sort of doing things, maybe you have a, a systems team that manages that base image. And maybe they want to make a change to it. When they make that change, hopefully they let the security team know. Security team can test it, can review it. You know, they have some meetings, they, they have some, t and, then, and then it maybe goes out. With this system, we don't, we don't need to know about that because we'll automatically detect it. We'll automatically run our tests against it. If there's no material change in security, there's no real reason to have a meeting or to change anything. We can just go forward. And, and sort of pushing on that idea of integration is, is the idea of integrating your testing, your security testing, into uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines. And this is a really... Um, I think really interesting topic because you have code that's being deployed hundreds and hundreds of times a day. How do you get your testing into that system? And one of our approaches to that um, is through what's called, a, so this is not a great picture, but I'm not sure if you can tell what's going on there, but this is a canary in a coal mine. And if you, if you know this topic, the idea was that in, in coal mines, there's all kinds of like methane and carbon monoxide and just poison stuff. So what they used to do is send a canary, a bird down there. And if the bird came back, you could probably go because the bird's more sensitive to it. If the bird doesn't come back, you probably don't want to go into the mine. So canary testing has, has gained a lot of traction in continuous integration and continuous deployment environments. And the way we implement it is if, I, if I'm using continuous deployment, what I'll do is I'll check in a change. That change will automatically get built. It will get put onto that base AMI, and then we'll push a canary instance to production. So my app might require, say, 100 nodes to serve production. So at this point, I have 100 production nodes. I have one canary node. That canary node is actually taking production traffic. And then you just you let it take that traffic for however long you want, maybe an hour or 12 hours. And then you can do all your security testing, your security observation, performance analysis, and then you compare it against a bunch of metrics against what's running now and what's ever been running for the entire history of that application. And you can see here, uh, this, this score, we have automated canary analysis where I can make a guess about, you know, what's my confidence that this will be okay? And this is a 97%. And with automated canary analysis, I can actually, there's no human intervention here. If I pass this, since there's over a thousand tests that have been run, it doesn't really make sense to have a human look at those thousand results. So just have the system do it and push it off to production, automatically migrate. It's passed all your security tests, all your performance tests. So really the lessons learned there or takeaways is, you know, what conversations can you avoid? And that's not something I would normally say because I think in security you want to go out and talk to people. but. You don't want to rely on somebody telling you about something. Like, hey, Jason, we just made this change, or we just launched this app. If you're waiting for people to tell you about those things, 
um, there's an opportunity for for improvement there. So what, what think about how could you how could you get rid of some of those interactions? And then also, is there a pyramid that you could leverage? So is there some base piece that you could spend time testing that would give you a lot of benefit throughout your environment? Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was configuration monitoring. Because um, this is important for security in agile environments, in continuous deployment, in uh, very uh, sort of fast moving DevOps, because things change so fast. I want to know, do those changes, do they have a security impact? Are they causing me a problem? And the best analogy I have for this is the idea of a self-service checkout in um, a grocery store. And I, I don't know how popular these are in Hungary, but they're, they've gotten really popular in the US. I don't like them because they're making me sort of do the work of the I guess if you're buying something embarrassing, it's kind of, it's easier because I don't have to interact with them. But the idea is that, you know, for the most of the stuff you buy, the milk, the bread, the eggs, it's fine. Just go do it. If you're trying to buy cigarettes or tobacco, you're trying to buy alcohol, somebody's going to get involved. So that's, that's the approach that we try to take. Is we think about there's, a, there's like a continuum, a spectrum of changes. Some of those changes are, oh, they're probably okay. And then there's a subset of those, like the alcohol and the, and the cigarettes, that I want to know about and I want to be involved in. And with, with things like cloud, right? Cloud, one of the fundamental characteristics or defining characteristics of cloud is self-service, right? Do it yourself. Agile is all about moving fast. If we try to act kind of the old way in security where we want to stop everything and we want to check everything, you're basically blocking the exact reason why businesses are moving to these technologies. They want to move faster. They don't want to go slower. So we wanted to sort of emulate this model, and we wanted to leverage this. And the, something that we built is uh, called Security Monkey. Um, Security Monkey is uh, we, we open sourced this in June. Um, and I have some of these stickers available if anybody wants one. Come find me afterwards. Um, but Security Monkey. What it does is it passively monitors the environment, the, the AWS, the Amazon Web Services cloud environment for changes. So Amazon doesn't really have a service for doing that where it can tell you how has this configuration changed over time. There, there are some things you can do with auditing, but there's no real way to say how does this configuration look different from last week or five minutes ago. So Security Monkey does all that for us. Um, that's another nice thing about sort of the, some of this new technology with cloud. Everything has an API. Everything is queryable. So Security Monkey does that for us. This is a screenshot here. Um, what we're trying to do is prioritize what we should be looking at. So there's all the changes here. And you'll see that there's one here in red. And that, that one in red, Security Monkey has a rules analysis engine that looks at configurations and tries to give us a signal of whether or not that change could be bad. So I could then go in here and see why is it telling me that this could be a problem. So takeaways, we'll certainly use Security Monkey if, you're, if you use AWS, but more generically, um, I, I like to think about that continuum of safety, right? Not every change is bad. I know as security people, we like to sort of keep things the same, but that's just, you know, not everything is bad and needs to be worried about. And find ways to observe and, and help differentiate off that. So just kind of concluding, hopefully this sort of came through. Um, I think first and foremost, you, you really want to have an idea of how you're setting your priorities. This is, this is just so critical to security. If you, don't have a, if you don't have a framework for how you decide what you should be working on first and what's most important, I think that's, it's going to be very difficult to be successful. So whatever your methodology is or whatever your approach is, hopefully it works and you can kind of tune it over time. Uh, and then the next takeaway or conclusion is integration. And with all these new systems like uh, CI systems and, and, and cloud APIs and service registries, think about how you can plug into those as a security person to get information that's useful to you. Uh, and then last but not least, of course, the hopefully this came through is um, a lot of this work, it's, it's just perfect for automation. And security automation is, is, a, is also some a kind of a new field, but uh, you really need to leverage uh, kind of computers and technology to do the hard work for you. So that's all I had. Thank you.